David. How have you been? Uh, it's been, been such a long time. It's been such a long time. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing spiffadoodless. I mean, you know, actually, all I've been doing these days is traveling. Traveling, traveling, traveling. Where have you been going? Another. Well, there's all the Colorado Springs. Yes. And uh, um, we went to Baltimore. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of funny because when you do sort of sort of experience events, you kind of look at them and say to yourself, how do I make it different? Uh -huh. And so I'm trying to create a story that one event actually, one elite event kind of continues the story to another. Right. So that could be kind of fun to do, but we'll see if I'm actually successful in being able to do that. Well, <laughs> my fingers are crossed for you. What's the weather been like? Has it been uh, treating you well? Has it treating it's hot. Events it's, been well? it's been hot. It's August. I mean, everybody's out in August right yes. now. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it was August, but mm -hmm. uh, when we when we first uh, got into that, but you know, it's uh, it's definitely uh, um, a uh, a change from the the winter months that are, are very close to coming on upon us right now. Believe it or not. Wait, what was that? I said the winter months that are close. Yes, to coming very. Upon us. Yes, they are very close. And they, you know, I always think that like the latter half of the year is so far off, and that. But and I always have those thoughts in June, and then by the time July is over, I'm like, oh shoot, it's August now, and you know, exactly. yeah. So it's just like it, I, I, I still feel like New Year's was just like a couple of weeks ago, and it turns out like we're more than halfway done with the year at this point. So Do you know the only the only way you can really tell is when you have kids. Okay. Or when you because when you look in the mirror you don't look any different right yeah to yourself right exactly <laughs> it's, when other, it's your kids that suddenly were in your hands mm -hmm. like a month ago or so it seemed and it's now like 10 years later now they're telling you what to do right <laughs> yeah i know kids aj no i remember when i uh, first started working with you you know royce was like super small but now i like see royce every so often and he's like growing up growing up growing up so that let's get uh, straight to the interview with uh, chris casamasa mm -hmm. uh casamasa casamasa if you said it in italian it's a, it's a real good italian name there uh -huh. anyway um let's get into that and uh we'll be right back after that good morning everybody i'm having some technical issues this morning from uh pasadena to sherman oak so you'd think it'd be rather uh easy to do but no sometimes it isn't i've got a great guest this morning chris casamasa chris good morning how you doing i am doing well sir thank you fabulous um so uh how, how's uh how's the pandemic life treating you uh, uh the first thing i have to ask people sometimes because we all have been dealing with it slightly differently yeah, well, we uh, we kind of adopted and adapted very fast for our uh, our company, which if your listeners don't know, we've got uh, 15 Red Dragon Karate schools here in Southern California. And we literally, when the pandemic started in March of, what was it, 2020 now, uh, we shifted our entire business platform that's been running for 50 years as an in-person business to an online only business. And it was out of necessity. It's something we wanted to do actually, because we saw, you know, success of like Peloton and Mirror, but the pandemic just kind of forced our hand to shift our business model completely onto an online platform. So it was a crazy uh, first week there. Of how how, how are you finding that? Because I know some people have talked about it, how, you know, it's difficult to shift because in-person classes, especially in martial arts, when you have to have be physically touching, have you found it difficult, challenging? Uh, are there some things that you've learned from it? Oh my God, we learned so much. There was, you know, fortunately for us, what we do translates onto video uh, very well. And our instructors and our instructor teams across the board are very dynamic in their presentation. And that actually helps coming across on Zoom. If you're, uh, if you're flat or kind of dull and listless in your presentation and you're talking, uh, it doesn't translate well. You know, you can get away with that mm -hmm. in the classroom where you've got a hands-on experience, but when you're on a camera, as yeah. you well know, yeah. <laughs> you've got to be a little bit over the top so the camera picks it up and reads it. And now you're trying to engage with people instead of an environment of a martial arts studio, they're in their living room, their bedroom. Some of our students were even in their closet because they had no other room, no other place to go. So those challenges, you know, especially the first couple months were really, really uh, difficult for us, but we adapted quick and uh, our instructor team and our owners were just did a really, really great job. And, and I kept nurturing them and working with them to help them help their customers. Cause really for us at the end of the day, that's what it was about is everyone was freaked out. Everyone was panicking. We were like the calm in the storm for them, kind of the eye of the tornado where they had a place where they could de-stress and, and just have a, a safe space just through the, the virtual world of Zoom. So did you, did you, um, how do your classes go? Did you, were they our classes? Did you shorten them? Did you keep them the same? What sort of uh, uh, structure did you have? And yeah, were they different the kids, in different schools? 
for the kids, our classes generally run about 30 minutes. That way they stay high energy. There's no downtime. There's no, you know, kind of boring part of the class. For the, for the teens and adults, they run 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the group and the belt level, because our classes are separated by age and ability level. Like I don't mm. have a six-year-old white belt in with a 25-year-old black belt. So right. there, it makes it a little easier to, to really dial in on what the student needs itself. Well, the, the, it's definitely been a challenge to, to sort of figure that out because I, I, you know, I do short classes all over the country and you know, trying to put the, the different levels together or mix them in the class is always challenging. I have, a slightly, I have one event, so I want to make sure that everybody sort of gets a, a, a um, what should we call it, a, a time uh, with a level that they're used to. But I also find sometimes that if they're, if they're pairing up, uh, that somebody with a little bit more experience can help somebody that's not as experienced because you're going to come up with somebody that's different, that uses a, a different timing or a different type of technique. Um, and, and I've always been surprised because sometimes teaching uh, these past five, six years, I've, I've learned more, I think the teaching than I did actually doing martial arts or doing sword because I see what other people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're right. When you, when you partner someone up with, someone who's more experienced it does help them that that a more experienced person becomes like a little mini coach within the teaching that you're providing so yeah i agree with that but with zoom especially because there's no one else there unless they have a brother or sister that's with them um, that's always the challenge i'll tell you one of the greatest things now i can do our entire curriculum backwards because zoom the camera flips right so oh, very that's quick, right yeah, yeah yeah very quick we learned hey if i go to my right that's their left so i have to i had to do everything backwards so we learned every form every weapon every self-defense move every kick punch block and, and technique that we have backwards so that the students would just mirror us and just copy and do it the right way right yeah because usually people follow you from behind yeah not following you from the front so it's a whole right. different it's a different setup uh, as you do that because you know i noticed people want to follow your motion or whatever motion you're doing rather than if you're looking at it they, they it's flipping their brain to actually yeah. get that to work for properly. sure yeah, yeah. So what got you? I, I, I know what got you into martial arts, but tell me what got you into martial arts? How did you how did you first get into the love of it? Uh, my dad, he's the founder and creator of our style and our system, Red Dragon Karate. He started that all the way back in 1965. So this is our 56th year in business mm -hmm. uh, that we've been doing it. And he fell in love with the martial arts when he was in the Marine Corps. He was stationed in Japan as a military police officer. So he started training in a style called judo. And uh, he made it to all the way to second degree black belt in judo while he was in the military, came back to the States and, and continued his training. And, you know, he's got now we've got black belts in 10 different styles of martial arts. Wow. And yeah, he I mean, he's so he was really my inspiration and him and Bruce Lee, you know, because I saw Bruce Lee on camera and I'm, I thought, wow, I want to do that. I want to do that. That's really cool. <laughs> But you my and dad was my million kids. For martial arts. Yeah. Me and, yeah me and, uh, Sorry, go on, Garen. That's all good. But um, yeah, so back in back in the 60s, he did something that was unheard of. And you've been around for a long time. So, you know, like back in the day, you were either a Japanese stylist or a Korean stylist mm -hmm. or a Chinese stylist. You didn't you didn't like cross the streams, as they would say. But uh, in the 60s, he decided to uh, ignore that and just kind of do his own thing and, and put it all together. And my dad... It, he's got so many great stories about people would come in and challenge him and they'd say, you can't do this. You know, you have to be one style or the other. And he would be like in his, in his New York vibe. Cause that's where he's from the East coast. He'd be like, you can't tell me what to do. This is America. I'm American. And the last four letters of American are, I can, I can do what I want. So of course too. The other thing in that day was they would come in and challenge you. And if you lost, like you had to close your studio, you had to move. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell people, listen, that was 56 years ago and we're still here. Right. I mean, so, the, the interesting thing is, it is about that. I always tell my son, I mean, my son's done a little bit um, and whatever he does, this is, whether it's soccer, whether it's martial arts, whatever, there's always somebody that's going to be better than you. There's always somebody better than you. And you have to be humble enough to understand that and be aware enough that that can, you can face somebody like that so that you can adapt to do a different technique against them or, or to, to adjust to what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's, right. a, it's a two, two way street. It's not just a one way. You can't just do a, 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 t a technique or a form and expect it to work. Somebody else might move to entirely differently. Yeah. Listen, I'm with you hundred percent. I don't believe that there's one best style. There's a best style for someone, but not the other way around. Mm -hmm. If there was a best style of martial arts, we'd all be doing it. Right? <laughs> Every style of martial arts has something great to offer. So that's one of the cool things about our style is, 
if you, there's an aspect or something that you like, we can adapt our art to you rather than the other way around. I mean, like Taekwondo, I love Taekwondo. They have the best kicks in the world, the best kick combinations. But if you're not flexible inherently and you can't kick, like you're not going to be that great in Taekwondo. Yeah, right. So it, it all depends on the person and what they're looking for and what they want to get out of it. Do you also think um, that it's also everybody's very different in how they learn and what they get from somebody, you know, you connect, you and I connect, uh, but you and I will have a different connection than you and somebody else. And you mm -hmm. will understand and have a different conversation when that happens. So part of it, is it also the teacher that they understand how that move or how that combination works from the teacher? Because two teachers could teach the same combination, but you could understand it better from one than another, just by the way the teacher is actually explaining it to you. Yeah, listen, I could not agree with you more. I, like you, have been around the world and I've met some of the greatest artists in the world. But there is such a big distinction that I need people to understand between a great martial artist and a great martial arts teacher. Those are two entirely different things. And just because someone has a black belt doesn't make them a good communicator or teacher. It just makes them a black belt. They earned it. That's, that's cool. Like I know, and, and you do too, I know some of the greatest martial artists in the world, but they're broke. And not because they're bad, but because they can't communicate what's in their head here in a way to other people that makes them say, I want to keep training with this person or I want to pay this person, mm -hmm. right? So being an effective communicator is hypercritical in your success as a martial arts instructor. And whether you're teaching one or a thousand, it's really irrelevant. It's the ability to communicate with someone else. And like you said, hit them in a way that makes them understand, oh, I know exactly what this person is talking about. Yeah, you know, the other thing I, uh, I think is important to understand is also that um, not everybody learns the same. And therefore, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've taught, you know, hundreds of people now, th over thousands of people now, and not all of them will get what I said, probably would be my, my guess, um, just because mm -hmm. of the way they understand things. Uh, hopefully, the majority of people did. But, you know, it is basically the teacher. And, and sometimes, you know, the human body only works a certain way. My, my, my elbow is only going to bend this way, but whether I decide to use a technique that has more of a, a circular motion or, an, or a straight motion to it, it's really on the way I, I understand movement or understand a, a technique of how to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Listen, and, and you well know that every human on the planet learns in one of three ways, right? Auditory, visual, or kinesthetic, right? They're either yes, going to see correct. it, they're going to hear it, or they're going to, or they're going to do it. Exactly, like for me, yeah. I'm a, I'm a kinesthetic learner. Like I want to, I want to do it. I want to get my, I want to <laughs> show it to me. And I look and I go, okay, cool. I want to do it. But there's some people that just can listen to me. And I say, all right, lift up your knee, throw your leg out, point your toes, bring it back. And all of a sudden, boom, it's perfect. Yeah. Right. So it all depends on the person. And that's why a great instructor has to a understand their students that they're teaching. What kind of communicator are they? Which kind of learner are they? And, and listen, it crosses over. I like seeing it and doing it. I'm not, I'm not so much a good listener, unfortunately, but you, if you wind me up and, and let me go, I'll, I'll do it for you. But every student, every child especially learns a different way. And if you don't hit all three of those when you're communicating your technique, whether it's a sword or a straight punch, then that person isn't going to learn it or be as good as they could be if the communicating side, the person who's teaching them could do better. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into acting? Because I mean, you, 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 Worked as a martial artist, or worked as a uh, did martial arts for a, a good amount of time, and you won a lot of competitions, and you you competed. So, what drew you to being an actor or using your your uh, skills in acting? Well, like I said in the beginning, Bruce Lee, I was I was a big fan of. Right, it was it was when I was growing up, it was him and Chuck Norris. That was it. All know? right, maybe maybe Billy Jack, if I'm really wanting to date myself, but. <laughs> Uh, but Bruce Lee was it for the martial arts world at that time. You're talking about the, you know, the early 70s. Um, so that inspired me. Like I said, I, I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that. I think I, I want to do that. And then all the ninja movies came out in the 80s. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, man, this is this is great. This looks really cool. So it's something that I always wanted to do as a goal that I had set. And like competition, you know, I started competing locally before I went on the national and the pro tour. Um, it was, it was just something that I wanted to do and something evolved in. I, and I learned in the martial arts, as I'm sure you did, it's all about setting goals because the saying I learned at a very young age was the goals we set are the goals we get. So I set a goal. I want to do this. I set a goal. I want to do that. And I didn't give up 
until I achieve that goal, right? So that's the focus and discipline that comes with learning martial mm -hmm. arts. Mm -hmm. And, and all, all the things I have in my life, all my success comes from the principles that I learned in the martial arts. But to answer your question, I started off with some small stuff, I actually ended up doing some background stuff in the original Karate Kid movie. I mean, I'm in LA, so I'm around the movie industry all the time. And so it just kind of escalated from there. I did, I was in Revenge of the Ninja with Sho Kazugi. I did okay. little parts, little things here, little things there. Uh, but I was also still competing. And then one night I was in Atlanta of all places where I won the grand championship at the Battle of Atlanta. Unbeknownst to me in the audience were producers from a TV show that they wanted to shoot at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. I won, a couple other guys won that night. So they came up to us after, afterwards and said, hey, we're, we're doing this TV show about martial arts and we think you guys would be great for it. Do you want to do it? And I was like, uh, yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> so yeah, we'll do it. Um, and then of course, as you know, as the movie industry goes, you don't hear from them for, for like six months. I didn't hear anything. So I thought, well, it's just another pie in the sky thing. All of a sudden one day my phone rings and says, hey, we're going to fly you down to Universal Studios. We're going to shoot the pilot. Uh, and then it ended up becoming a TV show called WMAC Masters. And that right. was on like Fox for three years. And, and it was a really fun experience. And so th from there, I mean, as, as you know, it's networking, right? It's, it's who you yeah. meet. It's not, it's not who knows you, it's who you know in the industry. And so I met other people and, and that kind of helped me evolve to, to different projects from there. So tell me, as a, when you, I mean, cause you've done, uh, you know, you've done shoot, fight, a fight to the death, a mission to kill, it's just yeah. some small thing. When, as a martial yeah. artist, when you walk in there on a, on a TV set or a movie set, you look at it and go, uh, they're doing a technique. Do you look at it and go, oh, I think they could do that better? Or, or you know, oh, I'm not sure why they would do that move. I mean, do you ever look at that from that point of view? Not really, because you said earlier, being humble, it was one of the things that I, I, again, learned. My dad taught me very well. Matter of fact, when I started doing movies, he said, Chris, listen, I'm going to give you this advice. He goes, when you get on the set, pretend everyone there is a black belt and you're the white belt, you're the color belt. And when they tell you to do something, you look at them and say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. He goes, then when you have a million dollars in the bank and they tell you to do something, look at them and say, yes, sir, but do you think we could try it like this? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So it was always, it was always, I never, I always went in there with, with uh, no, like, and my cup was empty, as I would say, and just try to fill it up. But what I did learn, especially on my first few films, like I'm a real martial artist. And so I would, they'd say, throw a punch, boom, I'd throw it straight. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, can't right. do it. So, so, so we dubbed it Hollywood dough instead of Kabuto or, or Budo or Bushido. We, Hollywood dough where everything has to go intentionally wide and miss on purpose. Because as you know, the camera doesn't read depth. So a straight punch on camera looks like a miss. Even if you hit somebody, it looks like a miss. So I learned that uh, at, a, at a young age. And I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of stunt coordinators and fight choreographers who brought me in because they knew the talent. They knew, you know, they hired me for a reason. So they're like, just show us your best stuff. And they shape it into the fights and, and do those things. So it's always been, uh, I, I've had some really good experiences on sets like that. Now you did, you did 24 episodes of WMAC Masters, right? Um, mm -hmm. That was one, one season or two? It was actually three seasons, and three I seasons. think uh, if IMDb may have it wrong, but we did maybe 32, 33 episodes of it, but they kind of spread it. I think our first season was 12 episodes, and then we did another 12 for season two, and um, they spaced them out. But yeah, it was it was cool. I got to actually live in Orlando, Florida for a couple of years, and uh, th that was really nice shooting that show. And, and listen, I got to work with some of the world's greatest martial artists because they really brought real martial arts champions onto that show. Uh, and we just had a blast down there. Now, I know, as you do as well, there's a lot of ego in martial arts. And, you know, one style is better than the other style and blah, blah. Was there ever any of that type of stuff when guys would come in, they do this stuff, and, then, and those egos would sometimes get a little bit tested? I don't want to say out of control, but tested, you know? Every, you know, every once in a while, the majority of the, all the, the, the regular cast members are our core group of people. It was, it was myself, Mike Bernardo, Hakeem Alston, uh, Herb Perez, Ho Young Pack, um, those guys, we, we were really formed a tight bond. And all of those people that I just named were also world champions. Like I wasn't the only world champion, they, they brought them in. So we all respected each other and the things that we did. Every once in a while, they'd bring in like, you know, a day player and stuff who'd be like, they want to challenge us, right? They're like, they're going to they're gonna step up and they're going to they're gonna try and do the thing. But uh, that's why, I don't, if you don't know Hakeem Alston, he was our, he was our onset security. He is a big, mean, bad dude. And, uh, but the nicest guy in the world, he's a teddy bear uh, <laughs> through and through. 
as long as you're on his good side. But you do something that's going to try and mess with with him or one of his friends, look out. <laughs>